Shush! It's time for The Shelf. Whangarei District Libraries Radio on Beagle Radio. Oh! Tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome to The Shelf, a radio show for Whangarei District Libraries on Beagle 88.1 FM and streaming online at beagleradio.co.nz. To catch up on episodes you might have missed, subscribe to the Whangarei District Library's YouTube channel. My name is LJ. I'm a cataloging services librarian at Whangarei District Libraries. And I'm Carly. I'm a technical services librarian at Whangarei District Libraries. And we're back together. <laughs> Yay! We haven't done an episode <laughs> together in a while. Yeah, it's a special birthday treat for LJ. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> wish LJ a happy birthday. Thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and it's also special because it is Banned Books Week, um, something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, so it's an honour to do this episode today. So Banned Books Week is 22nd to 28th of September. Um, and I pinched this from the Lianza Office Instagram, <laughs> um, which is the Library and Information Association of New Zealand Aotearoa. Um, and they wrote, Established in 1982 by the American Library Association, or ALA for short, this campaign is more relevant than ever. In 2023, ALA documented 1,247 demands to censor library books and resources. Whoa. Yeah. An increase in 65% of titles targeted for censorship compared to 2022, and the highest number ever recorded in 20 years of tracking. Titles representing the voices and lived experiences of LGBTQIA plus and black, indigenous and people of colour individuals made up 47% of those targeted in censorship attempts. Here in Aotearoa, we have seen increased challenges to books, programmes and events, mainly around the LGBTQIA plus community. Yumi Steins has reported that her book, Welcome to Sex, which in New Zealand was submitted to the classification office but remained unrestricted, has now been targeted in the USA by religious groups trying to have it banned. We don't have a national register of challenges here in Aotearoa, but we are working on it. So that was from Lianza. Mm. Um, yeah, so <laughs> kind of a, <laughs> a bleak opening. Yeah. Um, but uh, fun fact, uh, the last book to be banned in New Zealand was The Great Big Narcotics Cookbook in 2018. Uh, three years is what yeah. that was about <laughs> um, and it is one of 1,313 books that are banned in New Zealand you can find the mm. full list of what those books are online yeah um, and they all seem to be pretty similar to that uh, narcotics cookbook or yeah. things that are very literally literally quite dangerous yes. to you as yeah. opposed to <laughs> yeah as opposed so, to ideas yeah. or, or concepts um, yeah. yeah and uh, I was reading an article um, this morning um, from a couple of years ago that said that um, compared to other places in the world, uh, New Zealand is pretty, we're not super keen um, on book banning um, <laughs> compared to other places. Um, which is but, great, which but is it's great. definitely something um, that us librarians have an eye on. Yeah, it doesn't mean <laughs> that it's elsewhere. not a threat, yeah, yeah. especially as we see a rise overseas um, and now that we have a more global connected society um, mm. that tends to those ideas uh, can quite easily come to our shores and yeah like like Leanza said we have seen that in the past couple of years yeah and mm. it's yeah something we feel very strongly about like protecting yes. your right to the yeah. freedom of information yeah. and to read what you want to read yeah libraries have a commitment to intellectual freedom um, and freedom of of information as part of our profession mm -hmm. um, we don't make decisions for individual readers about what's appropriate for you um, but we do encourage you to engage your critical thinking skills and we've talked about that in depth <laughs> <laughs> on the shelf in the past um, and I think another thing to really note is that uh, we're librarians we're not parents uh, so our books are mm. placed in age-appropriate collections um, based on things like collection development policy um, but it's up to parents to monitor their individual child's reading. Um, it's not up to us or any other parents outside of that child's family to make those decisions. Um, totally. Yeah, um, yeah. It's part of, I guess, your responsibility as guarantor on the library card. Yeah, um, yeah, 100%. <laughs> Keep an eye on what they're reading. Yeah, um, and yeah, that's just 
part of parenting, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Being engaged with your child um, and, yeah, discussing whatever you feel appropriate to discuss. Um, and I also listened to recently, because apparently I can't get enough of library podcasts, I've <laughs> um, been really enjoying the Timberland Regional Library podcast. Uh, it's called No Sh and it's on Spotify. Um, <laughs> but their first episode uh, was about book banning because they're based in the USA and obviously mm. that is a hot topic um, right now over there. Um, and uh, one of them made a comment that, um, you know, because we, uh, we represent, we're a neutral entity, we represent ideas mm. of, our job is to present you with the resources and the information and then like I said before, it's up to you to engage your critical thinking skills and make up your own mind. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they made a comment that if there's nothing in the library that offends you, then we haven't actually done our jobs correctly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so true. And that gave me a good Yeah, laugh. yeah. Um, I think it will, there will always be something in the library that you don't agree with, absolutely. some book. Like, I could, there's things in the library I don't agree with. Yeah, of course. But I respect their right to be in yeah. the library collection. Yeah, that's part of, yeah, what we're trying to remain yeah, neutral um yeah and also like just to reflect like the diversity in our community it would be pretty boring if we we're all the same and agreed on yeah, everything absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah that makes the world go around um and yeah throughout history book burners and book banners are typically not on the right side of history <laughs> yeah. shall we say yeah um but yeah so for banned books we, we did something a little bit different and quite fun I hope um <laughs> well, it was definitely fun for us okay great um and uh we uh we had a, a band book club in which we read a band book and then we uh, got together and we had a book club as as the shelfie crew and we recorded that um so we're going to play that for you now um and yeah you'll be like a little fly on the wall at our book club um and hopefully you pick up the book and then you can yeah. see if you agree or disagree yeah, with and us. and let us know yeah, if you have anything to contribute to our yeah. book club. <laughs> <laughs> um, or if you have any ideas for um, what we should read in the future, um, because, yeah, we will uh, likely do it again, particularly yeah. if people enjoy it. Um, so I will play that for you now. Shush! It's time for The Shelf. Book Club. Whangarei District Libraries Radio on Beagle Radio. Oh! Kia ora, welcome to the inaugural Shelfies Book Club. Uh, my name is LJ and I'm joined with my fellow The Shelf hosts, Glenn, Carly and Andy. Um, and for Band Books Week, we all read Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Um, this book was never ban quote unquote banned per se, but it was challenged. Um, and the definition from the American Library Association on what a challenge book is is a challenge is an attempt to remove or restrict materials based upon the objections of a person or group. Banning is the removal of those materials. Um, and interestingly, um, in 1967, uh, Ballantine Books. Um, Re released a censored version for high schoolers which omitted uh, curse words and references to a drunk mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, for a, a specific high school, Ballantine High School. Um, and then in 1973, Ballantine Books started publishing only that version um, without Bradbury's knowledge um, and he found that out in 1979. Um, and so then the original book was put back on the shelf. So we're going to wow. talk about that today. And Carly's going to kick us off for a, with a recap. But before, there might be spoilers. This is not spoiler-free. Spoiler alert. So a lot of spoilers. If, if you haven't read the book, um, pause the podcast. Uh, it's very short, only 190 pages. So go and pick it up and then come back and um, you can listen to us talk about it. Cool. Okay, so Fahrenheit 451 is a dystopian novel set in the future um, where books are banned. In this world, firemen start fires by burning books rather than putting them out. 
Um, and the main character, Montag, is a fireman who starts to rebel against this world and his job after he stole some books from work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, well I, I, I guess I can just talk about the main character for a moment, uh, Montag. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd say he's, the character uh, starts the book behaving like he is a perfectly ordinary person, going to work, coming home. Mm. Takes pride in his job. I have a question written here. Is Montag stupid or just naive? And I, I want to lean towards naive yeah. because mm. he, he is a, a man starting to think about the world for the first time ever. Mm. Like a child. Yeah. Mm. Becoming self like aware of his, yeah. the context and yes. his world. Yes, he, he's actually starting to, to question things. And... Uh, it's inspired by a very peculiar neighbor who he has named uh, Clarice, Clarice McClellan. Mm. And she's uh, an unusual kid in this world. She asks questions, challenging ones. Yeah, I think in, at one point they, he says like she doesn't, she asks about the why of things when these mm. people don't think about the how or the why they just take things surface level yes, yes. she was such a cool character r.i.p yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and yeah he, he's a person who wants to do what everybody else does at montag and just speed through life mm-hmm. um and uh well i'd lean towards him being a naive character yeah. and he he does show throughout the book that you have to be a bit offbeat and strange in order to actually survive yeah. in this world. Oh, if, to survive. Yeah, because I was going to say Clarice self-identifies as, like, crazy. She's mm, like, I'm 17 yes. and I'm crazy. Mm. And that's, yeah, but she's not bound by these, the yeah. conformity and mm. of their world. So that's interesting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, we're allowed to spoil. Uh, <laughs> she meets a tragic end. Yeah. <laughs> Because in this world, people speed in their cars and don't really think about yeah. anybody else. Yeah. Mm. I was wondering for a while if it was on, like it was, if it was secretly on purpose because she was known to. Yeah, it was quite sort of vague until yeah. kind of the end. Then you get clued in to, mm. yeah, maybe it was, yeah, that she it was an accident or, or like intentional, but not yeah. with any sort of bigger purpose. It was mm. just like a sort of tragic thing that happened. Yeah. Mm. Just people's general uh, recklessness, need for instant gratification, mm. like speeding in your car, yeah. and it and it does kill teens regularly. Clarice mentions this. Yeah. Mm. Um, I I think perhaps it is around that point that mm. she has some kind of an effect on Montag. Mm. It's strange though that, like it's like in the book, she's like the, what's the word the thing that kicks him into catalyst. 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 Yeah. She's, she's the catalyst that makes him start thinking differently mm. but then at the same time and then he steals a book mm. but then it's revealed that he's already stolen mm, some yeah. other books he's got quite a collection mm. so maybe she was one of several catalysts that brought him to the yeah. point that we're mm. at but it kind of reads like he's completely naive and he's just woken up all of a sudden mm, yeah. but i wonder if there's kind and of some other that backstory that already reveal. Perhaps yeah. that's yeah. that's his facade. He wouldn't he wouldn't just reveal this to a, a stranger, mm. but but yeah, I'd, I'd say there might have been other catalysts, or maybe yeah. she's like, the one who encourages yeah. him to reveal his well, desire. Was there reveal again, sort of like later on in is it the beginning of part three, where uh, the uh, captain, what's his name, ba- Beatty, mm-hmm. yeah. is sort of reveals that he's been watching and following Montag. For a while, so mm. like even though the as the reader, you're kind of not clued in. You know, it's a bit of a surprise that he's mm. been hiding these books. Obviously, he's been exhibiting some kind of other behaviour mm. that has made um, yeah. Betty suspicious of him prior mm. to Clarice coming on the scene. Yeah, it was yeah. that was an interesting choice. I and thought. he had met Faber before, is the other thing. Like yeah. Um, yeah, mm. so maybe that was part of it. As Faber? Well. Who was Faber? The, 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 the older man, the professor oh, that's that, right. help, that that's helped right. him. That's right, he met yeah. him in the park, yeah. yeah. The speeding yeah. thing I found kind of weird. So is this is that talking about society's just lost all of its moral compass and they're just 
Is that yeah. what that was about? Because I sort of found that a little bit odd. Yeah. The, I, I, I'd say it has something to do with people sort of just not me caring. Sort of of a clockwork orange, that kind of aspect yeah. of it. It's, it's sort of senseless, like, violence. Yeah. Didn't, didn't he encourage his wife to go off and speed in the car, or she said, come on, let's go speed yeah, in yeah, the car? Yeah, that gives her a thrill. Yeah, she encourages him to do that, to, like, calm down or something yeah. Yeah, at yeah. one point, or get it out of his system or something. Yeah. She's a, an extreme case of somebody mm. needing constant stimulation. Mm, yeah, uh, which seems to be, though, the norm in, in this yes. v- particular version of society. Yeah. Yeah. I love that actually about because it's quite reflective of our modern life. Mm. And it yes. was kind of like quite predictive, wasn't it? Like, yeah. He, he didn't exactly, pre- no one seems to have predicted smartphones and mm. our inability to get off them. But yeah. yeah. In, the, the in the book, he talks about having a special, like a TV room, which is yeah. surrounded by yeah. the number of screens. Yeah. And she wants more, more screens, screens so she can be more interactive. Yeah. yeah. She's living in this online world, basically, without it being called an online world. And uh, completely divorced from reality. Which is really interesting because when you read some of what Ray Bradbury sort of said when technology was first coming out, he was actually very pro technology and he was like, uh, you know, uh, what did he say? That neo Luddites or something is what he <laughs> called people that were being resistant towards it. And then that kind of changed like a few years later and he was like, this is, I think this is a bad thing. Actually, we didn't. I'm not quoting yeah. directly, paraphrasing yeah, he hugely, went, but he was like, this is a bad thing, actually. Yeah, he went on yeah. to say that it was more about TV being a dangerous thing. Yeah. Um, and he sort of switched from originally censorship as the main theme to mm. the idea of spectacle and mass yeah. media and yeah. te- television Which addiction. I think thing. sort of both were kind of yeah. valid. I mean, mm. um, I saw somebody did, had a review on Goodreads and she was saying, like, I don't, I don't totally agree because there are still people in the world trying to ban and censor books, but, but she, I thought that her point was interesting. She was talking about, like, after the fire comes the flood and, like, in mm. this version uh, mm. uh, of society, you know, books are sort of being banned, yada, 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 but she's saying now that, like, books are getting, there's such a huge... Um, the word well we yeah, flood of information mm-hmm. from so many different sources that you know books are kind of like drowning was her sort of take on it mm-hmm. um which i thought was interesting because yeah you do hear people a lot say oh i used to read heaps i wish i could still read or yeah. um yeah or i'm getting back into reading after not reading for ages or you know different things like that i just thought that was quite interesting yeah I think I, I want to just go back a little bit, if I mm. can, to something uh, about Mildred. Yeah. She watches this TV show all the time. I find it interesting that this show is tailored to her, mm. much like how your ads mm. on mm. Facebook are yeah. tailored to you. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if Bradbury was uh, criticizing television, this could be a critique of modern social media mm-hmm. about being caught in an information bubble mm-hmm. and also the banality, even the stupidity of a lot of the AI gener- generated stuff on mm-hmm. Facebook, which mm-hmm. is utterly mindless and has, it has nothing to do with anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but people are still sucked in by it. Like you'll yeah, see people you share scrolling. things and be mm-hmm. like, wow, what a fantastic photograph. And you're like, hello, that guy has six toes. This is clearly That's, not a real <laughs> image. <laughs> that, that is not a photograph yeah. of Mona Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> Doubt it. Uh, yeah. But people are still yeah, sucked in. But, and I think it's getting harder as that stuff gets smarter. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah so perfect um, relevance for... So the book's actually still quite relevant. Is one yeah, of the surprising I found it thing eerily was. relevant. Mm-hmm. Like the first half, I was like, oh my gosh, we have that, we have that. I was reminded yeah. of, like you said, TikTok a lot. Um, mm. Because yes. uh, like how Mildred says the television characters are her family, even yeah. though there's no plot, apparently. It's just yeah. all surface level and her attention span is probably not that great. Um, yeah. But like it reminded That's... me of like how I follow people on TikTok yes. and I want to check in with them every yeah, day. Like that parasocial, I don't know them. parasocial yeah. relationship. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, so that was spooky. Mm. I I also noticed in this book uh, I started thinking about it in the first chapter 
talking more about books now, but Montag says something to, uh, to Clarice. He says, oh, oh, we burned some Faulkner. We burned mm -hmm. some Mark Twain. These names would have no relevance mm. in this society. Mm. So I'm kind of wondering, in this world, what do names like Shakespeare or Faulkner mm. mean to people mm. if they're still using them at all? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because how would he know about them, and how would she know about them if they've never read them, why they're important, but maybe... Nobody reads. Mm. <laughs> but maybe it's... I'm I just thinking of... maybe it's like that, that's a common thing to say about bad things. You know how yeah. societies will have yeah. derogatory things to say about yeah. cultural things, other people or whatever. Mm. Mm. So maybe that's... I don't know. The, yeah. I... There were some strange anomalies in the book, yeah. I thought, in, in reading yes. it, that I was like... Oh. Yeah. yeah, great book. I, I kind it, of wonder. Yeah, I sort of wondered at some because I listened to an audiobook version mm. narrated by Tim Robbins, which um I do recommend. And I, but I sort of wondered. I was like, if this book didn't have as good of a narrator, I, maybe I would be more bothered by <laughs> some of the whole because the, the way that Tim Robbins, Tim Robbins is in the Shawshank Redemption. If you if you're struggling yeah. to remember who that is, um. But like in the sort of high, he did all the voices, but like in the kind of the chasing scenes and the tense scenes, he kind of like talks like this and it's very like, mm. the tension Emotional, was really yeah. there. So like I feel like I kept listening because I was like, oh my God, what's going to happen next? But like every now and then I would kind of go, oh, it's a random little plot. Or like I felt like it jumped a little bit. I don't know mm. what it was like reading it, like in a physical copy, but there was some parts where I was kind of like, oh, okay, we're, we've raced through this part and now we're on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, like I kind of felt like, it, yeah, it does move really fast. It's like you, it at the beginning, like that, he's yeah. like, yeah, I love setting stuff on fire. And then like, <laughs> you kind of, you're like, yeah, you're like three quarters through and he's like, I'm a fugitive on the run. Like <laughs> <laughs> what I've been doing with my whole life is wrong. Like it, it's quite a, it does feel because it's such a, quick uh, short book it does mm. sort of feel like oh whoa that was a really uh quick mm. turnaround from um yeah falling in line to totally living outside the system <laughs> do you think it would have any effect if uh if instead of name dropping super famous people like shakespeare what mm. if they name dropped someone who is not very well known mm. at all mm, it yeah. might if hammer we... home this idea that you really can yeah I think one of the history. big yeah, but one of the big things I noticed, and maybe this is perhaps the limitations of the author himself or the era I, that it was written. I don't know, but um, like at the end when the professors are sort of naming the books that mm. they've memorized, um, no women authors yeah. are mentioned yeah. whatsoever at all, all <laughs> throughout this entire book. Western European yeah, and a, uh, North American. Very, yeah, very, very incredibly niche um, kind yeah. of set of, of ideas and books that have been banned. Been banned. Like, I think Marcus Aurelius comes up more than yeah. once, um, which kind of made me laugh because I feel like the writing of the philosophy of Marcus Aurelius has been having a resurgence at yeah. least at our particular library lately so I was like well he's not going anywhere anytime <laughs> soon um but yeah I sort of found that interesting and then also as well um like most of the female characters in the book are very much like mm. either side characters or yeah there to like move the the plot forward I don't mm. know what Ray so, Bradbury yeah. thought about <laughs> women but but I just sort of noticed I was like is there no cultural contribution you can well, think of, or is it just I, probably? It's an older I, my book. guess would be of its time. Mm, and, and yeah. The copy that I have from the library, uh, it's mm. in the sci-fi. It's not in the classic section. It's in the sci-fi mm. section. Yeah. Um, he, there are three introductions mm. in the oh, front, oh, wow. which I did not read until the end. <laughs> but the, yeah. the, I'm just going to look. There's the uh, <laughs> yeah. There's the introduction from. Oh, where's the contents? Yeah. Well, the different years. Yeah. 2003, which was the most recent one. Then there was a 1980 one, mm. and then there was a 1960. And are they all written by him? All written by him. Mm. Slightly updated each time, but in that you go and learn how he wrote this book in a really short time. Yeah. He basically locked himself. He discovered he was writing some short stories and locked himself. I didn't lock himself. Yeah. But he discovered that you could get um, 
rent a word process, no, a typewriter, I th- underneath I the such and such public library yeah. and took in $8 of quarters mm. and sat for one week yes. writing the book. The, yeah, the fine, man. And then he went back or something and wrote the second half yeah. a while yeah. later. So he kind of just whipped this so thing out. So it does out. explain Pretty. the gaps. So that's <laughs> when you, possibly yeah, when why you there's gaps and, and maybe, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'd actually, yeah, I'd forgotten about that, but I hadn't yeah. heard that story. And also, yay, yeah. public libraries. Yes. <laughs> I wonder yeah. how many books have been written in public yeah. libraries. Well, he was, mm. he did champion public libraries. Oh, he was a library. Um, oh. Yeah. Tell us more. Do you know more? Than <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, around the time that the book was published. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, the notion of book burning really uh, disturbed him mm. um, when the, the Nazis were doing it. Mm. Um, mm. I, I don't know much about yeah, his. No, uh, was was he a cataloger? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know that. <laughs> um, but I think the authors that he names were probably in the librarian's uh, lexicon, so mm. to speak. Faulkner's books would have been not that old at yeah. the time. Shakespeare's uh, not much older than yeah. that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was wondering if yeah. the name dropping was more of a tool for audiences to yeah. be shocked yeah. by, but also I, I was thinking, I was. like, we don't know when this is set, but we can yeah. sort of gather from the fact that Faber was once a professor in his mm. lifetime yes. mm. that it might not be, it might be around our era. 2025? But I thought that... Um, like, at the end, the professors he um, catches up with mm. and how they've memorized books, it seems like that maybe the name dropping might also be a hint that it's sort of locked in the background of people's memories still because it's yeah. not that, like, far into the future, I maybe. I was going to say, my kind of, like, the way that I interpreted that was that I felt like that potentially it had happened not that many like, like generations mm. previously like maybe Montag and his wife hadn't been around when books were still allowed to be read but I sort of got the feeling that it was like their parents generation mm. perhaps or their grandparents generation that um mm. that had been mm. reading books and that was kind of why well, that Clarice's family yeah, next door had the three about, generations they yeah remember. she talks about her uncle and like yeah how he used to say that the firemen used to put out fires rather than start the, the, the plot hole with that one is that, mm. okay, you've got three generations of fugitives mm. sitting next door, <laughs> and just then they get caught out. But presumably they've been talking about yeah. it for decades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 the crackpot next door. <laughs> guy. We've all what, had one. Yeah, one <laughs> shut up about books. <laughs> I, found yeah. the, um, I found the first... Did you? Enjoy, I I enjoyed this book, by the way. I thought mm. I really thought it was cool. I enjoyed this era yeah. of kind of writing. First chapter, I was like, "What the heck is going on in this?" Yeah, I found it at the first sort of fifteen minutes. I was like, mm. "And that's why I say I don't know if I would have enjoyed it as much if I had picked up the physical copy first, but because of the way that like Tim Robbins was doing all the voices yeah. and building the tension, so yeah, definitely for the first like." Mm, maybe not quarter but yeah first like 15 20 minutes or so i was like oh why did i pick this one? <laughs> <laughs> and then i was like oh my god what's gonna happen um yeah it was, yeah. It was a good one to pick yeah it's okay. that first scene with the the wife sleeping in bed mm. oh that was it was just kind of uh, uh, and uh, my son's been reading it and then mm. we both had the same thing we both reread the same page mm. like what is happening oh I think this is happening but it wasn't completely no. clear what was happening yeah. but then that's what I quite like enjoy uh, mm. as well yeah. because you're like what is happening here this yeah. is a bit odd <laughs> what is going on yeah yeah, yeah. One, one thing I, I have to wonder about this society it's obviously a totalitarian mm. government well sort of yeah. it sounds like uh, when they're talking about the elections later on, it sounds like they sort of give them the illusion of choice and that there is, because the wives are talking in is it part three, and yeah. sort of sounds like mm. they, they there are two candidates that they can vote for, but like one is the obvious, like I remember when they're going, he's short and ugly, who's voting for him kind of a thing, you know, like what, he 
I can't remember what she says, something really, one of the wives says something really out the gate, and yeah, about it, but like, yeah, who, who wants that guy? Like, of yeah. course I voted for so and so. But yeah, so that kind of surprised me because I was like, oh, I thought that they'd just done away with elections entirely. Mm, yeah, well, the the uh, the main focus of the book, I think, is just one facet mm. of a totalitarian society, mm. the control of information, mm, yeah. which, which did raise a question with, for me. Um, I I feel like maybe Ray Bradbury is either showing an absurd definition of censorship, or maybe he didn't know mm. that in censorship you don't just censor everything; mm. some things are select things that do not toe the line mm. and other things would be allowed mm. or even be tailored to mm. fit the narrative of the uh, mm. regime in power mm. um, things that do not contradict or criticize so I would think wouldn't they be producing very well written propaganda mm. in books well, for the, people to still yeah, read the firefighters have a rule book I think that That's was right. the only One that was book. the only uh, yeah that was the only <laughs> book I think that was sort of mentioned that was because I rem- in, remember him mentioning that and then he pulls it up when he pulls out the book later on yeah. when the wives are around to watch the the show um, they're like oh have you been brushing up on the firefighter rules or something <laughs> like, like that you know like that's the only thing that they can fathom. Yeah. you having a book well, on. Because you can't read, obviously. Too. Yeah, they, they can they read, can all so they must read. be taught to read, yeah. reading something. Yeah. Well, look, this is where, this where it all falls apart. <laughs> Subtitles Maybe on TV. Maybe I was going to say, like captioning. Because we read in this house. Yeah, it's yeah. inclusive. Yeah. <laughs> my, <laughs> got... my, my feeling was is that the, it's, it's about the books being burnt being replaced by the screens, the yeah. television, mm. whatever you want to call it. The television information. And that's sort of, I don't know how they... I agree mm-hmm. that they would, in, in the history, when they've banned burnt them, propaganda. they've done propaganda yeah. books of their own. Mm. And, you know, every everything has a slant. But so a could... few characters also mention the fact that it wasn't that hard to get rid of books because people just started yeah. to lose interest yeah. in them and they would rather be um, runners and, uh, what is it, they talk about athletes and tradies or something like that and... Well, but Nobody wants that, to be an intellectual anymore. That, does, that not, does that not tie in with your earlier statement of how we're seeing in our current world, oh, even I've said this, oh, I wish I don't read as much, you know, because mm. yeah. the competition from mm. um, devices and technology yeah. is supplanted in yeah. some ways. But then the I think it's, uh, you see a lot, well, I mean, I see a lot as a librarian. I feel like in recent years there's a lot of people pushing back against that, you know, that they are coming in with the express purpose of, like, Mm. I want to get back into this. I'm I'm sick of sitting and staring at my Yeah, device. you do get those comments a lot, yeah. actually. Um, I want to get back into yeah, reading. Or like, yeah. I used to have a library card. I want to yeah, get back into reading. Or like, yeah. people get really excited when, you know, like, they're talking to me about their Audible subscription. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I go, you know that you can get books for free. You know, they haven't been into a library for so mm. long that their concept of, what we are is like a little bit outdated and they don't realize that they can actually get you know free audio books through the library and things like yeah. that like when once they realize that there's all these different ways that we can help them mm. access whatever it is they want to read um they yeah they're like oh oh my gosh oh, i can do that um but yeah there's yeah you see there's sort of been a rise in books being written about like how to retrain your brain and how to fix your attention span and yeah. like those kind of topics um so yeah it is interesting um it seems to tie into i feel like a lot of people are also going back to analog ways of doing things as well like you know they're trying to collect dvds because they're sick of their favorite shows getting taken off streaming or like people are yeah. going back to cds vinyl is selling as well as it was in 1985 like yeah um stuff like that so it kind of feels like there's been a more of a collective push in recent times of like mm. oh actually this is great in some ways but in other ways it's not so great and there's stuff that I miss <laughs> <laughs> about doing it uh quote-unquote old-fashioned ways mm. I want to ask everyone uh, yeah I think it's inevitable to compare this to 1984 because it 
mm. uh, what they were released at in, I think the same yeah, era. I uh, think it was. A few this would years be later, apart. wouldn't it? This would be a few year, only a few years later. Really? Yeah, wow. let's have a look. Because this was fifty one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and 1984. Ooh. It was written in 1949. So. Oh, wow. oh, two years. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> what about the comparison okay. to 1984 then? Well, I, I will say um, I hmm, I liked 1984 more. I will say that I have not read 1984. Oh, <laughs> it, it'll it'll be on the shelf. I think it's uh, 1984 is a more complete. Yeah. Novel of, of yeah. everything's it's a it's yes. like a perfect world situation. Yeah, this one is much shorter. I'm guessing and I've, has possibly yeah. some, as we mentioned, some like plot holes or just yeah. jumps that you go yeah. oh, that make me. But I still I like them both. Yeah. this was a lot more pleasant to read than 1984. Every time I've read is more of an adult book. Yeah, and it's, it's bleaker. Very yeah, much this more bleak. feels yeah. a bit more hopeful. Like they're going to rebuild. Yeah. Yeah. The whatever. phoenix rising yeah. from the flames. Yeah, there's uh, going to be some kind system. of yeah. solution. Yeah. yeah, and I think they talk a lot about like humanity being able to reinvent itself and like, yeah. come mm. back from... Well, the, this one at the end, because, you know, fire's a thing throughout, and at the mm. end they're going around and he's putting his hands around the fire and it's like he's, yeah. they're warming yeah. their hands for the first time, like using... Yeah, like, that's a good. Like, fire, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fire, good. Well, they're yeah, returning to the Stone Age almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. True. They're going back to an oral tradition. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they've memorized these books so that one day that perhaps they can print them again. Is that a form of piracy? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I thought Survival. was interesting, actually, you've reminded me, is that um, because. Uh, Ray Bradbury was quite resistant at first to his books going into e format, and That's then right. when they did yeah, go okay. into ebook format, he the only way that he would allow that to happen in his agreement with Simon and Schuster is if that there was um, uh, there was no limit because uh, we've talked a little bit on the shelf before, like when I talked to Penny about the e resources, mm-hmm. a lot of the time we have metered access or we mm-hmm. pay for x amount of uses or x amount of copies. Um, and his stipulation was that um, he didn't want there to be any kind of metered access if it was going to be, the e-version was going to be checked out through libraries. He wanted to know, um, like, as many people can have it out at a time okay. as want to have it out. Like, there would be no cap on that. And he was one of the only um, authors that had that particular agreement, like, for a really long time. I don't know if there's any been any since him, even. But, yeah, that was his thing. He was like... If it is going to go E, then I don't want it to be limited in any way, mm-hmm. which um, yeah. I yeah, thought was quite interesting. Okay. So we, we prefer 1984. But, but you well, know what? That's an opinion. Well, I haven't read it. I'm just saying, Andy and I have, but, but you know what? <laughs> I feel bad for saying that. I feel guilt now for saying yeah. that. Yeah. I feel sorry for Ray. Because <laughs> the other cool thing about this is it's, I just, it's, it's quite funny how he's twisted the firemen completely around. So mm. firemen are the most respected, aren't they, and trusted people in our society. Mm. Yeah. And then yeah, in this one, it's, true. it's just flipped it completely. So they're kind of like these bad people. Mm. But and I, it's just quite a good concept. But society still doesn't think that they're bad. Like, even in this society, they're still respected for what they oh, do. that's true. Because that's they're true. protecting the people from the big scary book. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. In the logic of this story... I, I, it, you have to get used to it in the first chapter or so, kind of like an episode of Black Mirror. Mm. You yeah. have to figure out what are the rules of this strange yeah. sci-fi Yeah, world. you kind of <laughs> dumped into it, but he's also not a very descriptive writer. I would have probably liked a bit more like, of the scene set up. Isn't. I feel like the, he spends a lot of time on sort of like these big metaphors, mm. but then, yeah, in terms yeah. of the world building, not so much. But then... Um, that's what you get for 170 pages. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Rather for younger, than George R.R. R. Martin. Yeah. Yeah. It's for younger readers, uh, I think. And, and this is often required reading in the U.S. for, uh, mm. I, if I remember right, uh, high school, high school, maybe yeah. 14, 15 years old. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
And it, the, and it's it's a perfect age for this book. Yeah. yeah. 1984 is a lot bleaker. Well, it hammers you over the head with the themes, <laughs> like, and the metaphors on the, yes. yeah, so for, for a, yeah, English mm-hmm. class, uh, it's a great book to dissect. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And, yeah, unlike 1984, I still was... was got away happy at the end of this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 1984, the last time I listened to that, I just, at the end, I thought, why did I put myself through <laughs> trauma? Is there, do we want to address the elephant in the room with Ray Bradbury? And oh, what's Ray Bradbury? What's the elephant? In the 90s, he, so his sort of point was about, he felt that political correctness was the, um, that, that society's version of, um, of book burning, I guess. Um, what did he say? It was something to do with special interest minority groups that didn't like particular things, he felt. Um, but I just thought, thought it was interesting, given that was his perspective then, and I think he died in like 2012, and I sort of wonder what his perspective would be now, because um, I, when I pulled up the American Library Association, uh, the number of book titles challenged in the US jumped uh, 40% in 2022 from 2021 Mm. and the main targets of those challenged books were uh, books that included the quote-unquote special interest minority groups that he was talking about so I kind of wonder if he was still alive today if he would have um yeah changed his perspective Mm. on what he thought was being banned because we can see in the stats that (laughs) Yes. <laughs> it hasn't gone the way that he right. supposed that it well, would. Well, you mentioned, someone mentioned earlier on that he was um, pro-tech to start with and then changed yeah, his mind. Yeah, which is kind when, of what makes me wonder, like, yeah. would he have, yes, yes, spun around on this as well? I don't mm. know. Just <laughs> the, the interview cited here is mm. from when I was nine, and uh, <laughs> I don't really remember this <laughs> on TV, but... Um, uh, yes, it, in a 1994 interview, Ray Bradbury called political correctness the, quote, real enemy these days. Mm. And he he called it, quote, thought control and freedom of speech control. Mm. I, I think, though, um, he said this many years after uh, publishing his book, and he had mm. said uh, previously that this book had more to do with book burning by Nazis, Mm. which would be fresh on people's memories Mm, in the early 50s. Yeah, for sure. And the context of that time would be McCarthyism. Um, Mm. Basically, people in the U.S. pointing the finger at each other, saying, you're a communist. I'm not sure I, I really saw a whole lot of McCarthyism in this book, but definitely this fear of the other, this fear of outside influence warping mm. people's minds. And the way that they all come out of their, the TV instructions, them all to come out of their house near the end to oh, look, to, look yeah, for yeah, him yeah, yeah. on yeah. the run. That's I right. was like, yeah, that sort of reminded me of that whole thing of like, the, yeah, policing each other. Yes. Yeah. And the, the other background too is the nuclear warfare threat after yes. us. Mm. That's the whole underpinning thing of that here in constant planes going mm, overhead yeah. Yeah. Mm. so that is the other backdrop to this which is hard, harder for us I think to I mean he describes those planes shaking the house and going over yeah. and at the end they watch the city get bombed mm, yeah. that was the real fear for people mm. I think more f- even though it's still an actual genuine threat yeah. to the world now we're so we're not feeling it Removed like people were feeling it, it yeah. in the 50s when people were building well, their shelters. That, yeah, and he's sort of talking about in it as well, them being desensitised to the, you know, like yeah. saying, oh, there's a war on kind of a thing, but it's in the background, mm. the TV's more important, yeah. and like other people's husbands die in war, like my husband's probably yeah. not yeah. going to die in the war. Mm. It happens to other people. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, um, here's a library kind of fun fact. Mm. Okay. Um, so there's some rules in our library. Generally, when we've got books, fiction books, we might look at weeding them after, mm-hmm. as in discarding them after five years, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. depending on use. This one was introduced to the library September, no, sorry, 19th of December, 2003. Wow. Oh, all right. It's an old timer. Yeah. Right, so do we ever give stars? How many stars out of five? Out of five. Oh, oh. I think it was a solid three for me. Ooh, yeah, so. <laughs> that's not bad. For yeah. me, that's good. For me, a three star is like, um, I 
enjoyed it, I won't necessarily go back and reread it. When am I really rereading it? <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a four out of five. Um, although it is not my personal favorite, I think it is right for the age group for which it was written. Mm. Um, I think it has a lot of historical relevance um, in, in terms of literature. Mm. It's now considered a classic um, because people just keep going back to it, yeah. mm. regardless of my own opinion. Um, so for me, four out of five. Yeah, mm. yeah, I'm four out of five too. I think um, I really enjoyed reading this and I enjoyed that it was really an accessible read. And I liked looking at it from a um, librarian's perspective mm -hmm. as well. Um, so yeah, four out of five for me. I, I was, when we did this as part of Banned Books Week, mm. Banned Books Week, mm. I just kept waiting in this book to find out where's the controversy. I almost started <laughs> skipping ahead. There must yeah. be some terrible was... sex scene or something in here. <laughs> and I, I got, I was like, it what? was the cuss words and the reference I, I to a drunk, apparently. See, this and is I don't even so, really remember. I don't remember any I'm, cuss so, words I'm so lowbrow. I don't this remember any pretty, cuss words. Pretty tame. Yeah. 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 But um, I like things to be, I like, you know, music that's lo-fi. Mm. So for me, despite its uh, inadequacies, mm. and some, I'm five out of five. I thought it was really good. Oh, okay. great. Hey, that was fun. Yeah, it was. We should do this again sometime. Definitely, definitely. Good Ka kite. Ka kite. Ka kite. Welcome back to The Shelf. Uh, you're back live with us in the studio on Beagle Radio 88.1 FM um, and online at beagleradio.co.nz. If you want to get in contact with the station manager, please email info at beagleradio.co.nz. Um, I hope that you enjoyed that. It was a little bit different um, for us on the show. Yeah, but um, I have to say we were quite proud of ourselves for that <laughs> <laughs> riveting discussion, our first ever book club. Yeah, um, and also we wanted to mention that it's actually recently gone one year of the shelf podcast. Woo! Woo! Um, which, yeah, and we're pretty proud of what we've put out so far, um, unlike other podcast we don't have um producer um any kind of fancy we just have our wonderful friends here mm -hmm. at beagle radio at 116 that allow us to use their equipment but we do all the editing all the prep and the writing for all the shows um yeah the the four of us that you heard talking and occasionally zana when she's working when she's for around. us at the library and she's around these parts um so, yeah, yay for one year. Um, and yeah, and we'd love to hear your feedback or yeah. anything you want to hear us talk about yeah, on the show. Especially going into yeah. it as we're starting to plan for the new year. Um, and Andy and I actually roasted Fahrenheit 451 during our Roasting the Classic segment on That's episode right. 17. <laughs> um, I listened to it quickly this morning. Um, so if you want to go to our YouTube channel and... Um, listen to that it's a good laugh because obviously at the time I had never read uh, Fahrenheit 451 and now I have so. oh, that was a good introduction <laughs> yeah definitely um, cool but uh, we've got some exciting stuff coming up at the library I'll hand it over to Carly yeah so as many of you might already be well aware of Whangarei Fringe Festival kicks off this Friday the 27th of September Woo. and our Whangarei Central Library is hosting a handful of free events throughout the festival. Um, cool, and we're going to quick fire list those off now. So, the Moving Book Club, impromptu dance performances about and among books, Friday 27th of September to Sunday 13th of October. And we also have the Human Library, borrow a person and listen to their story, and that's on Saturday the 6th of October. Uh, Jerry Paul and the Elephant Tree, music for the young and young at heart, Sunday the 7th of October, I think there might oh, be yeah, a typo yeah. here, um, <laughs> uh, dra oh sorry, oh yeah we also got Dragons in the Library, um, that's a Dungeons and Dragons game day and that's also on Sunday the 7th of October. Uh, the Night Library and Cafe, enjoy the library at night, Wednesday 9th of October. Um, if you want to hang out with me and Carly, come to that. <laughs> yeah, we'll be there. Um, and there's also Early Birds and Bookworms, a multi-sensory book reading session for families or sessions. Um, and that's on Friday 11th of October to Sunday 13th of October. 
And then um, the pest of resistance. Um, <laughs> I know that our non-fiction and fiction collection librarians have been working very hard on this event. Uh, it's the Kaituhi, a celebration of Northland writers on Saturday 12th of October. So there's an author's gallery, meet authors sitting among the bookshelves, sit down and have a chat. Uh, there's author talks from Jade Cake and Wendell Nissen. And there's also an author panel, Healing Through Words, Lauren Roche, Dr. Melissa Gilbert, and Janet Balcom discuss how writing improved their lives. And for that one, um, prior booking is required for the author talks and the panel. So um, visit our socials and check out the library website to learn more if you search Fringe. Um, or, of course, the Whangarei Fringe website also has details. Yep, and we'll also give a shout out this Saturday, I yeah, believe, the 28th of September. Um, our pal Glenn. Fel fellow Shelfie. <laughs> yeah, uh. Our fellow Shelfie. Um, his band Mermaid Bait um, and the Brass Monkey with the Sideshow Hustlers yeah. uh, performing at um, the Town Basin in the. Cirque de Fringe. Cirque de Fringe. Yeah, in, the, um, in the big tent that's been set up down there. Yeah, so um, that'll be an awesome show. Yeah, let's go and see Glenn. Uh, moonlighting yeah. <laughs> as, his, uh, <laughs> as a vocalist rather than uh, a librarian. Yeah, um, and so there's a whole bunch of um, shows and sessions and all this on the Whangarei Fringe website. They've got the full program. We've also got copies at the library if you want a hard copy of what's I do if I happening. Get in quick because they're going fast, um, and you can get tickets either on Event Finder for events, the ones at the library. Are as we said, but for the other events, um, or you can come in Monday to Friday, 10 to 1, I believe mm. the box office is set up at 116, um, to buy tickets to things that you would like to go to. Yay, I've yeah. been sort of looking at what I want to go to as well, There's it's so exciting. so much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, a lot. <laughs> so what a cool town, what a cool yeah, initiative. it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, so that is what we've got for you today. Um, we're going to play you out with a song. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have, I think I already said this, but if you have suggestions for books you'd like us to read in the future, it's part of Shelfie Book Club, um, yeah, let yeah. us know in the comments. Um, yeah. I'm going to play you out with a song. Um, if you're new, I always try and have a book-related song. Um, mm -hmm. And just so happened that Bright Eyes recently released a new album and there's a line about book banning <laughs> in one of the songs. So um, we're going to play you out with Bastian Ada by Bright Eyes. Ka kite, and we'll see you at the library. Ka kite, happy banned books week. <laughs>